The question that we're going to take up tonight is this. Who appears at the judgment seat of Christ in Romans 14, verse 10? Who appears at the judgment seat of Christ in Romans 14, verse 10? And I really should have used the word stand, but look with me at Romans 14, verse 10. Now, we've received some questions recently about the judgment seat of Christ. And there are some on the internet that teach that the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock and not the body of Christ. And so we want to consider whether that position is true or not. The phrase judgment seat of Christ appears in two scriptures in the Bible. It appears in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, and it appears in Romans 14, verse 10. In a previous lesson, we considered 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. So tonight, we will consider Romans 14, verse 10. And what we're going to do, just to give you a preview of what we're going to cover, is we will first look at the arguments that are used to say that the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock. And then what we will do is we will look at the Scriptures themselves and see what the Scriptures have to say. So let's start in Romans 14, verse 10. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the basic question is this. The verse says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Who is the we? Does the we refer to the little flock? Does the we refer to the body of Christ? As best I understand it, the arguments that are made in favor of the little flock are based upon Romans 14, verse 11, which is the next verse. Let's read it. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And the arguments that I understand that are made as to why the we can't refer to the body of Christ are twofold. The first is, the body of Christ does not bow the knee to the Lord. The is, the body of Christ does not confess to God. In other words, Romans 14, 11 says that every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. The argument is the body of Christ doesn't do either of those things. This is the argument. And therefore, since the body of Christ doesn't do those things in verse 11, therefore the we in verse 10 cannot be a reference to the body of Christ. Christ. So that's what we're going to consider. Now let me start before we jump in. Look with me at Romans 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So I'm going to show you tonight what I think the scriptures say, but you need to be fully persuaded in your own mind. Well, how are you fully persuaded in your own mind? Get with me Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, and look with me at verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So they received the word with readiness of mind. They were willing to receive it. But what did they then do? They searched. They searched the scriptures. And how often did they do it? Daily. So they heard what was taught, but they didn't just believe what was taught. They searched the scriptures, and they did so daily. That's what study is. It's searching the scriptures, and the term there is 
daily. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look with me at verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. To prove all things means to evaluate. It means to test. It means to determine whether it is true. You don't just take someone's word for something. You prove all things. How do you do that? By searching the scriptures daily. Now notice what the second part of verse 21 says. Hold fast that which is good. Doesn't say hold fast everything you hear. Doesn't say hold fast everything on the internet. Hold fast that which is good. Now if you look at how the verse is structured, you first prove all things, then you hold fast that which is good. You start by proving all things. You don't hold it fast until you prove it. Once you prove it, then you hold it fast. Now, just to make this point to be clear, my personal opinion is that each individual believer, not just the pastor, not just people that are teachers, not just people that are preachers, every individual believer has a duty to study the Scriptures. And I say that because of 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself. Each individual believer must study for themselves. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. There is shame involved, rightly dividing the word of truth. The believer has a duty to search all things, to study. It's not simply just listening to things. It's not just simply watching videos on the internet. That's not study. Watching videos is not study. Study is study. In other words, individual time that you spend in the scriptures, looking at what the verses say, comparing verse with verse, allowing the Word of God to teach you. Now I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you a bunch of things tonight. I'm going to tell you some things that I think to be true. But you know what you need to do? You need to prove all things. You need to search it out. You need to look at the reference I give you and see if they're true. You need to search for other ones and see if there's other ones that may tell you something different. You need to do your own individual study. Okay? So that's my word of encouragement to you. We need to be Bereans. We need to search the scriptures. We need to prove all things. That's true for every one of us in the body of Christ. So with that, let's consider the first argument that is made in favor of the view that the little flock is who is referenced in Romans 14.10. And the first argument is that the body of Christ does not bow the knee. Well, look with me, if you would, get Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to look in Ephesians chapter 3 at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who's the I in Ephesians 3.14? The I is obviously Paul. You can tell from Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 that Paul wrote Ephesians. Paul says, for this cause I... Paul, bow my knees. Well, did Paul bow his knees or did he not? He obviously did. Is Paul a member of the body of Christ? He is. So the argument that the body of Christ does not bow the knee just isn't true. I mean, look what the verse says. For this cause I bow my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In case there is any doubt, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's the author. So the first argument that the body of Christ does not bow the knee, is it's just not so. Ephesians 3.14 is a complete disproof. It's, it's, it's that simple. The argument just doesn't work. The second argument as to why the we in Romans 14, 10, is the little flock, is that the body of Christ does not confess unto God. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Now in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 9. Philippians 2 verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name 
which is above every name. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's another proof about the bowing the knee. How many knees bow according to that verse? Every. Every knee should bow. And then notice what it says. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Well, what part of creation did it leave out? Let's look at it again. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. There's nothing else. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Philippians 2.10 is a reference to all of creation. Now, the body of Christ is presently on earth. Right now, we're on earth. The body of Christ will be in heaven. Whether we're in heaven or earth, we're subject to that verse. Notice what it says. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. What God does in that verse, it's obvious, isn't it? What he is saying is that all of creation will bow the knee. That's what he's saying. That includes angels. That includes devils. That includes the lost. That includes the little flock. And do you know what else it includes? It includes the body of Christ. Just as Paul said in Ephesians 3.14 that he bowed his knees. Now look with me at verse 11. Verse 10 said every knee. Verse 11 says every tongue. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, that, that every knee in verse 10 corresponds to every tongue in verse 11, right? In other words, when 11 says every tongue, it's talking about the things in heaven, the things in earth, the things under the earth. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, if you have a tongue, you're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the second argument just really doesn't make sense. The second argument is the body of Christ does not confess unto God. That's the argument. But what does it say? Every tongue. Every includes every. And verse 10 tells you it's things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, the two arguments really just don't make sense. Now, I want to spend a little bit more time on the confession argument because I think there's some interesting things we can learn. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the 1828 dictionary. This is really simple. You can see it's at Webster's Dictionary, 1828.com. You can go to DuckDuckGo, type it in. You'll find it not hard to find. I think part of this confusion is that there may be a misunderstanding of the word confess. And so let's look up the word confess. So I typed in confess. I'm going to hit return. Now let's notice what it says. Now the first definition here is to own, acknowledge, or avow. And we'll talk about that a bit more in just a second. But notice the second definition. The second definition is in the Catholic Church to acknowledge sins and faults to a priest. Now, is Scripture using the word confess in the sense of, verse, uh, in the sense of meaning to? It's not. That's a specific definition in the Catholic Church. But, but the first entry is to own, acknowledge, or avow. Look with me at the third, fourth, and fifth. To own, avow, or acknowledge. Publicly to declare a belief in and adherence to. Meaning four, to own and acknowledge. Verse uh, Entry five, to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true. In other words, if we look at the word confess, there are multiple dictionary entries, but it's obvious that one of the meanings 
is to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true. So the word confess has as one of its meanings to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true. Now let's look up another word. And we're going to look up the word Lord because it talked about confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. The word Lord has the meaning of a master, a person possessing supreme power and authority, a ruler, a governor. So let's make sure we understand both definitions. The word confess means to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true. The word Lord is a person possessing supreme power and authority. So now look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the confession is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does the body of Christ confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Well, let's do a simple substitution. Does the body of Christ own, acknowledge, and declare to be true that Jesus Christ possesses supreme power and authority? The answer to that is yes. Is Jesus Christ Lord? Yes. Does Jesus Christ possess supreme power and authority? He does. Do you confess that Jesus Christ possesses supreme power and authority? You should. It's a true statement. Don't we believe that? Don't we refer to him as the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul refers to him that way multiple times. My hope for you is that you believe that. I hope that you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because he is. That's, that's a basic principle of the faith that I hope everyone believes. Let me just say one more time to be clear. To confess is to own, to acknowledge, to declare to be true. Shouldn't we all declare to be true that Jesus Christ is Lord? I hope so. Shouldn't we own, acknowledge, or declare to be true that Jesus Christ possesses supreme power and authority? I believe that. I hope you believe that. The Bible teaches that. So does Philippians 2.11 refer to the body of Christ? Yes, the body of Christ does exactly that. Look with me at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And we'll look at chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. So this is a charge that Paul gives. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's at the rapture. Now notice in verse 14, he specifically uses the phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is Lord. And we do confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We declare that to be true. Now notice verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. What God is going to do is he is going to show to the universe that there is only one potentate, that there is only one king of kings, the Lord of lords, and that is Jesus Christ. Paul specifically says he's going to do that, and he is going to do that. Does Jesus Christ possess supreme power and authority? Yes, because he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. There is no one higher. We confess that. We believe that. All of creation makes that confession. Every tongue does. 
So the second argument in favor of the we in Romans 14, 10 being the little flock is that the body of Christ doesn't confess to God. Philippians 2 is, is absolutely clear that the body of Christ is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is, is, is there anyone so bold as to say that they refuse to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? I, I mean, d don't, don't do that. I mean, he is. He plainly is. And we need to believe the Scriptures. So, the two arguments in favor of the we referring to the little flock just don't hold water. The body of Christ does bow the knee. The body of Christ does confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's just turn to Romans 14.10 and let's just see what the Scripture says. Let's do that. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the question we're really trying to answer is this. Who is the we? Who does the we refer to? Well, let's go to Blue Letter Bible. And let's do a search here. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out who the we refers to. So let's type in we, and let's run a little search here. So Blue Letter Bible is bringing us our results. It's calculating. Let's see what it comes up with. Now, I want you to show you something here. So there's 1,844 times where the word we appears. Now, of course, the word we, you have to understand the context, right? So in other words, if you're reading a, a book about, you know, a group of people over here, the we is going to have a meaning in that context. And if you read a different book about a different group of people, the we is going to have a different meaning in that context. Well, we're obviously concerned about the book of Romans, aren't we? So watch what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to go to advanced options and I'm going to scroll down here, and I'm going to go to Romans. And then I'm going to click the search button. It's really simple. All I did was we have the same search of we, but now we're going to focus specifically on the book of Romans. Now, this is Blue Letter Bible. You can run this search yourself. This is free. It's easily available. It's, it's perfectly easy for you to validate what we're doing here. It's very, very simple. Now, what we're simply trying to do is we're going to look at other verses in Romans to see what the we refers to. Because there's, there's this issue, does it refer to the little flock or does it refer to the body of Christ? So what we see here is that it occurs 81 times in 55 verses. Now I told you earlier uh, that I think we're all, we all need to be students, we all need to search the scriptures, we all need to prove all things. What you should do is, after this program, you should run this search, and you should read these verses, and you should see what they say. What I'm going to do, for the sake of time, is I'm not going to read all 81 of them, but I encourage you to do that, to, to, to check this out and see what it says. But what I am going to do is I'm going to read a, a, a couple verses to you. Get with me Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, which is shortly before Romans 14. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. Drop the mic. You realize in Romans 14, 10, the issue is whether we refers to the little flock 
or we refers to the body of Christ? Romans 12 specifically tells you who it refers to. Let's read verse 5 again. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Who is the we in verse 5? I'll give you three options. One option is the little flock. Option two, the body of Christ. Option three, the Cincinnati Reds baseball team. Who is it? I mean, Scripture tells you the answer, doesn't it? We, being many, are one body in Christ. That's it. It's resolved. How do you get around that? The issue in Romans 14 is who does the we refer to? Does it refer to the little flock? Does it refer to the body of Christ? What happens when you read Romans 12? Romans 12 tells you the answer. We refers to the body of Christ. That's it. That's the resolution. Now what we're going to do, this is not a complicated issue. It's not confusing because Romans 12, 5 just told you the answer. We refers to the body of Christ. But let's be careful and let's be very precise. It's possible that between Romans 12, 5 and Romans 14, 10, that Paul said, well, time out. I was talking about the body of Christ in Romans 12, but now I've changed subjects. And now I'm talking about the little flock. Maybe he did that. How do we know? Well, we're going to read it together. So let's just do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to read Romans 12, we're going to read Romans 13, we're going to read Romans 14, and we're going to pay attention and tell me when Paul says, time out, I was talking about the body of Christ, but now I am changing things up, and now I'm going to talk about the little flock. All right, so we're going to start in Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So clearly, as of verse 5, he's talking about the body of Christ. Now let's look at verse 6, and let's look for when the subject changes. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, we're doing a lot of reading. I know you can read, and I, I get that. But there's no verse in Romans 12 where Paul said, okay, time out. I'm not talking about the body of Christ. Now I'm talking about the little flock. You realize there has to be a verse. If, if, if he's changing subjects, he has to tell you. You can't just make it up. You can't just change it to someone else because you want to. Scripture has to tell you, hey, we're changing subjects. We were talking about the body of Christ, but now we're going to talk 
about the, the little flock. There has to be a verse. Well, Romans 12 doesn't have a verse that says that. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So notice verse 11, it talks about our salvation, we believed. Who is that? Look at verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Well, do you know of any verse in Paul that tells you about the putting on the armor? Look with me at Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 11 is written to the body of Christ. Now, just so we're clear on this, Ephesians is one of the very last epistles that Paul writes. Paul writes Ephesians after Acts 28. He writes it after the close of the Acts period. If you make Ephesians about the little flock, I mean, just, just think about if that's what you want to do. If, if you take a, an epistle that is after Acts 28, after Israel has been fully set aside, and you make that about the little flock, what are you doing to all of Paul's epistles? I mean, it's, it's absolutely clear that Ephesians 6 is for the body of Christ. It tells us to put on the armor. That's exactly what Paul said in Romans 13, 12, when he said, let us put on the armor of light. The cross reference for Romans 13, 12 is Ephesians 6, 11, which is obviously about the body of Christ. In other words, as we're reading through Romans, Romans 12, 5 is about the body of Christ. We haven't seen anything that changes the subject. Romans 13, 12 is about the body of Christ. So we're still talking about the body of Christ in Romans 13, 12. So get with me Romans 13, 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So we've been through all of Romans 12. We've been through all of Romans 13. Not a clue that it's talking about the little flock. It's not. There's no, there's no time in there where Paul said, I'm changing subjects. I'm going to talk about something totally different. He never did that. The we is still the same we. So now we got to do Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one, that, for one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Would someone in the little flock believe they can eat all things if they're zealous of the law? He wouldn't. Verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. 
and let not him with eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. So we see the word we again there in Romans 14, verse 8. Romans 14, verse 8 is an accurate description of the body of Christ. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Isn't that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, also talking about the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look with me at verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 14, 8 says the same thing as 1 Corinthians 6. Both of those are written to the body of Christ, unless you're going to decide to make all of these written to someone else, but it's pretty clear that that's written to the body of Christ. Let's go back to Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we, it's the same we as Romans 12. It never changed. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So let me just say it again so we're clear. And we'll move on. Romans 12, 5 specifically said, we, and I'm going to quote it because I don't want to be accused of misquoting it. So Romans 12, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. That's a reference to the body of Christ. We read every single verse between Romans 12, 5 and Romans 14, 10. There was no verse about the little flock. There was no verse about the Israel of God. There was no verse that said, hey, time out, I'm changing subjects, I want to talk about an entirely different group of people. There was none of that. There was no clue, there was no hint, there was no evidence, there was no nothing that says, I'm not talking about the body of Christ, I'm talking about the little flock. Well, in the absence of such evidence, who does the we refer to? It's the same we. And that we is the body of Christ. There is no basis in the text of Scripture itself for saying that the we is anything other than the body of Christ. If you want to just make up reasons, you can make up reasons. But there's no basis in the Word of God. Now look, let's look at Romans 14.11. Romans 14.11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. We've already dealt with those verses, so I'm going to move on to the next. Look at verse 12. So then every, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The angels are going to give account unto God. The devils are going to give account unto God. The lost are going to give account unto God. The little flock is going to give account unto God. You don't think the body of Christ is going to give account unto God? You're going to give account unto God. It, it, it is a dangerous teaching. It is a false teaching to say that the body of Christ does not give account unto God. We are going to. Don't kid yourself. You're going to be, if you're a member of the body of Christ, you will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't pretend that you're not, because if you pretend that you're not, 
it, it, would, it would be a very bad idea. You're going to give account. You need to recognize that. And you need to structure your life accordingly. Look with me at Matthew 12. Folks, J Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He made all of creation. Everything that was made was created by him and for him. All things that were made. You, you, you don't, how can you think you're not going to give account? You're a created being. He made you. He saved you with his shed blood. We are going to account to him. Now I'll give you a, a, a proof here, one example. Look at me at Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And I realize this is in the prophetic scriptures. I realize it's in time past. But notice what it says. Every idle word that men shall speak. It uses the word men. It doesn't say Israel. It doesn't say the lost. It says men. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Look at me at Galatians 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. That's a warning there. And the warning there is there is deception that you need to be aware of. And then notice what it says. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Are we going to reap what we sow? We are. And if you don't believe that, Galatians 6, 7 warns you that you've been deceived. Is God going to be mocked? Are, are we going to show up at the rapture and are, are members of the body of Christ who have lived wicked lives, can they say to God, God, you saved me by his grace. The Lord died for my sins. And you know what? I got away with living a wicked life as a saved man. I, I, was, I was horrible in what I did. I taught false doctrine. I, I took your name in blasphemy. I did all these horrible things. And you know what? I'm going to get the same treatment as Paul. Wouldn't that mock God? In other words, God, your word, all the things it told me to do, it told me to walk worthy. I ignored it. And I got away with it. I got away with it because there is no consequence. There's no consequence, God, because I don't give account. The judgment seat of Christ is not for the body of Christ. It's not for me. I don't have to give account. I got away with all of it. Do not believe that. That is foolhardy. That is irreverent. That is rebellion against the word of God. That is the attitude of our wicked flesh. Verse 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9, and let us, who's the us? The body of Christ. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Paul specifically says the body of Christ is going to reap if we faint not. But what do we have to do? We have to not be weary in well-doing. Obviously, we give account. Do not deceive yourself into thinking that we don't give account. Now, I'm going to go back to Blue Letter Bible. I'm going to go to advanced options here. And I'm going to um, go to the top. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the Pauline epistles. That's my search range. And now I'm going to run a search for a little flock. And the idea is some think that 
2 Corinthians 5.10 is about the little flock. Some think Romans 14.10 is about the little flock. Let's see what Scripture thinks about this. And we'll run a search, and we'll see all the times that Paul uses little flock. We'll wait on it to calculate and give us the results. A Blue Letter Bible is thinking very carefully. It wants to make sure that it gives us the right answer. Little flock. There are zero verses in the Pauline epistles that have the term little flock. Well, if you're going to say that the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock, isn't it strange that the term judgment seat of Christ never appears in the prophetic scriptures? Now, let's, let's just, I'm going to use the chart here for a minute. So, come on, chart. The term judgment seat of Christ is a term that only Paul uses. The little flock is a term that is under the kingdom program, and Paul never uses the term. In other words, the little flock is a prophetic group of people. You know that because they're mentioned in the prophecy program, and Luke 12 says they're going to inherit the kingdom. The judgment seat of Christ is a purely Pauline term. Paul is a member of the body of Christ. He never uses the term little flock. Think through this. How odd would it be for Paul to take a purely Pauline term that's never mentioned in the prophetic scriptures and it's about the little flock? Let me put it a different way. If the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock, it's fascinating that no prophetic scripture tells them that. The little flock is mentioned here. This is all about the little flock, the foolish nation, the believing remnant in Israel. There's verses all throughout here that talk about that foolish nation, the little flock. But the judgment seat of Christ is never mentioned there. It's never mentioned here. But if it's such a big, important event for them, wouldn't he tell them about it at least once? Hmm. And if that event is so important, and if, Paul, and if so much of Paul's epistles are focused on the little flock, why wouldn't Paul use that term at least once? It just doesn't make any sense, is the answer. Now go back to Romans 14.10. Romans 14, 10. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, one of the things that is said, so we're trying to figure out what the we is. And what some will say is some will say, the we is the little flock. Now, we've already seen that's not true, but they'll say the we is the little flock, and they'll simultaneously say, Paul is not a member of the little flock. So they go to Romans 14, and when they see the word we, they say, that word we, that refers to the little flock, which there's no verse anywhere that says that. And what they also say at the same time is the word we doesn't include Paul. So that seems strange. So what I want to do now is I'm going to go back to the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and I'm going to look up the word we. And I, I know that we all know what the word we is, but I guess there's confusion about this, so let's look at it together. We, pronoun plural of I, or rather a different word denoting the person speaking and another or others with him. Now let's make sure we got that. The word we is the pronoun plural of I. 
denoting the person speaking and another or others with him. In other words, the very word we, it's very meaning, and we all, we all know this. It's the pronoun plural of I, and it includes the person speaking. When someone uses the word we, they're including themselves. That's just, you know that, that's just how that is, that's how it works. Well, when the word we is used in Romans, who's the person speaking? Who's the I? Get Romans 1. Get Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm just going to give you my opinion. You can decide for yourself. I think the person that wrote Romans is Paul. That's my personal opinion. You can decide whatever you want. It's, you know, you have liberty in Christ. You can decide whatever you want. My opinion is Paul wrote Romans. And I think that because of Romans 1.1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. So I think Paul wrote Romans. Verse 13. Now I, so here we see the word I. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Verse 13 and verse 14 use the pronoun I multiple times. It's someone that purposed to go unto the Romans, but was let hitherto. My personal opinion, I think that's Paul. Verse 14, he was debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians. I think the I there is Paul. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Just my opinion, I think the person that wrote Romans is Paul. I think when he uses the word I, he's talking about himself. I, don't, I, I hope that's not controversial. Uh, isn't it obvious? Get Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 13. Romans eleven thirteen. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Again, this is just my opinion. I think Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. I think when he uses the word I, it's a reference to Paul. Hopefully you agree with that. Romans 11.25. Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In verse 25, someone uses the word I and he's trying to tell them a mystery about Israel being blind. I think the I in Romans 11, 25 is Paul. Romans 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me. I think that person is Paul also. Now, this is not complicated, but just to make the point, the word we is the plural pronoun of I. The word we includes the person speaking. You can have your own views. My opinion, the person who is speaking in Romans is Paul. The person who is the author of Romans is Paul. When he says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, it's Paul. I mean, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it painfully obvious that the we and the, that the I is a reference to Paul and the we has to include Paul just by the very meaning of the word? What you can't say, Romans 14.10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, that we is the little flock. Well, there's no verse that says that. Well, we is the little flock, but the word we doesn't include I. Come on. I mean, we, pronoun plural of I, denoting the person speaking. 
the word we, just by basic, the basic meaning of words, has to include Paul. I mean, isn't that obvious? When you use the word we, it includes the word I. I, I so I, I just, I don't know how many times to say it. I mean, that, that has to be the case. That's how language works. So now, let me ask this question. The word we, in Romans 14, 10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That we has to include Paul. It does. So the question then is, is that we a reference to the little flock, or is that we a reference to the body of Christ? Well, if we could find other verses in Paul's epistles that tell us whether Paul's in the little flock or whether he's in the body of Christ, we would know the answer. So look with me at Romans 12, 5. And I know we've been here earlier, but let's look at it again. Romans 12, verse 5. Romans 12 and verse 5. So we, we includes I, we've already established that, being many are one body in Christ. So was Paul a member of the body of Christ? He was. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. What we're trying to determine here is whether Paul is a member of the body of Christ or the little flock. Because Romans 14, 10, use the pronoun we, which has to include Paul. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we, that includes Paul, baptized into one body. Was Paul baptized into the body? Yes, he used the word we. Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we, again, that includes Paul, because we includes, includes I. For we are members of his body. Romans 8, 23. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. And not only they but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we, we includes I, we includes Paul, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. See, the we, in Romans 8.23, similar to the we in Romans 12.5, that's specifically said to be the body of Christ, what is this we doing? They're waiting for the adoption to with, with the redemption of our body. Romans 8.23 is yet another proof that the term we in Romans is a reference to the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The we in 1 Thessalonians 4 includes Paul. Paul thought that he was going to participate in the rapture, and thus Paul thought he was part of the body of Christ. So what we have seen is this, Romans 14.10 when it says, we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the we is a reference to the body of Christ. You know that because Romans 12 specifically told us that it was. There's no verse between Romans 12 and Romans 14 where the subject changes. 
So the we is the same. And you know that the we has to include Paul because the word we includes the person who is speaking. And you know that the we has to include Paul because Paul is a member of the body of Christ. To put it another way, Romans 14.10 has to be about the body of Christ because the we there is a description of the same people in Romans 12. Now, what if you disagree with all that? You have, you have freedom to believe whatever you want to believe. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you disagree with it, that's fine. But you need to have a verse. You need to be able to point to something between Romans 12 and Romans 14, where Paul says, time out, guys. I was talking about the body of Christ, but now I'm talking about the little flock. You need to have a verse that says that, but there's no verse that says that. And if you want to say, well, the we in Romans 14, verse 10, that's the little flock, but the we doesn't include the person who is speaking. You can't just make stuff up. You can't just ignore the meaning of words. The word we includes the speaker. The dictionary says that. So you can't just pretend that the we doesn't include Paul, because it does. Get with me 2 Peter chapter 1. It's obvious from what we've looked at that the we in Romans 14.10 is the body of Christ and the body of Christ is going to appear before the judgment seat, which is a term that only Paul uses. That is very clear. Let me show you something. 2 Peter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. See, what 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 tells us is this. It's not proper to go to the Word of God and just put our own views on what it says. What we need to do is we need to come to the Word of God in faith and believe what the words on the page say. We, we don't need to go, we're not supposed to go by private interpretation, we're supposed to believe the book. And when Scripture tells us that we is a reference to the body of Christ, that's what we should believe. So Romans 14.10, just like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the only two verses in the Bible that specifically refer to the judgment seat of Christ, both of those are referring to the body of Christ. So does the body of Christ appear before the judgment seat of Christ? We do. At the catching up, we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we shall give account. And that's why what we need to do today is we need to walk worthy. We need to do all of the things that Paul commanded us to do. Let me close with, with this thought. Why didn't God take us to heaven immediately after we got saved? Wouldn't that have been nice? We wouldn't have to be on this sin-cursed earth. We wouldn't have to deal with bodies that decay. We wouldn't have to deal with all the problems that we face on this earth. Well, he left us here because he had work for us to do. We were created unto good works. That's what Ephesians 2 tells us. And so what we need to do is we need to be preaching the gospel. We need to, people tell, we need to tell people the truth about the gospel so that they can be saved and that their eternal destiny can be changed. Does it matter how the body of Christ lives? Yes, it does matter. Because the body of Christ, just like the rest of creation, will give account 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. We appreciate your attention. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity that it gives us. We thank you for all the members of the body of Christ. We pray that we would be diligent in preaching the word. We pray that we would preach the gospel accurately and clearly. We pray, Lord, that people would be saved and that they would come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.